to be here in this beautiful church again. And this time I'm also so happy that my wife is also with me, Florence. <laughs> Thank you so much for your prayers, support, and love for Pakistan. It is always a joy to share the word of God. So this morning before I share message, I want to answer two questions. Whenever I come to America, I have to answer many questions because Pakistan is, very inter is, a, is an interesting country. Many people, they want to know about Pakistan because they have heard a lot crazy things about Pakistan in the news. So that's why people are curious. Are there Christians? How God is working there? Or is it possible to be a Christian and still being alive? So I have been asked many questions. So two questions this morning I want to answer. Number one, what God does when we say yes to him. What God does when we say yes to him. And second, how we do ministry and plant churches in Pakistan. First question, what God does when we say yes to him. In 2014 and 2019, I was back and forth to Korea. And after all, my, I finished my study. And many of my friends, they told me, don't go back to Pakistan. Pakistan is not easy place to be a Christian. And you want to go back and do ministry or mission in Pakistan. So I believe when we say yes to him, he does amazing things in our lives. So I went back to Pakistan. People told me, don't go, to, don't go back to Pakistan. People are leaving Pakistan and you're going back to Pakistan. Are you crazy? I said, only crazy people do different things. So I will, be, I will go back to Pakistan. So I decided to go back. I thought, God put in my heart, I'm the, I'm the right, right person to be in Pakistan. Because I know their language, I know their culture, I know the, uh, their book, their religion, their everything. So I know where I have to go in Pakistan, where I don't have to go to Pakistan. Where I should say, where, where, where I should go share gospel and where I should shut up my mouth and wait for the right time. So I said, I'm the right person. So I decided to go. I said yes to God. And you can see, this video is just a small trailer of what God is doing in Pakistan. Who would imagine that a building can be built in, uh, during pandemic? In 2019, we prayed for this building. 21, last year, we just uh, demolished our previous building. We started building this church. This building can hold 2,000 people. 90 to 95 percent work is already completed. Pandemic and building church. Many people, they discouraged me. It's not going to happen. I said, no, I believe God is going to do. One year is not bad. One year, in, within one year, this building is ready. So when we say yes to God, he does amazing things. Impossible things happen in our lives when we say yes to him. That's what God all wants from us. Yes. Because he's our master. He wants us to say yes to him. In a good way. He doesn't want to make us slave. We are slave, but very free slave. You know, Mark, uh, Abraham Lincoln, he was in a market where they were selling the slaves. And Mark, uh, Abraham Lincoln, he bought a slave girl. And slave girl was very mad 
at Abraham Lincoln, she thought, now my life is going to be terrible. And after Abraham Lincoln bought her, the girl looked at her, at him and said, what I need to do now? He said, you are free where you want to go. You are free to do what you want to do. That's all. She said, I want to go with you. We are slave, but we are very free. Free slave. Hallelujah. So, but what God does when we say yes to him, we are plenty. I don't want to talk negative much about Pakistan today. If you want to read negative, you can read this book, and it will help you to understand what negative is happening in Pakistan. So, things are difficult. We, are, we build this building. No, we are... We are already planting churches. My vision is to plant 100 churches in Pakistan. 11 we have already started. Five we have building and six new churches, they don't have buildings. We are renting buildings or we are worshiping in the house. 11 we have planted already. 89 more to go. <laughs> 89 more to go. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is just beginning. And God wants to do, to do more things in Pakistan. This vision is bigger than me. But my God is able to do that. He is able to. He has done. I am so brave. I can take bold steps now. Because I, I can tell people on the basis of my experience. That God is very faithful God. When we say yes to him. He will do impossibles for us. And he has done already. 100 churches is not a big thing. Right now it seems maybe bigger. But I believe God has already done, he will do again for us and for me. 11, we, have, we started a school in Pakistan in 2019 with three, with three children. And now we have over 200 children in that school. Pandemic and school is growing, church is growing. You can see 500 people every Sunday, they're worshiping the Lord in, in this beautiful building. 500 people. And it's growing very fast. Our church is growing very fast. Why? This is happening in Pakistan. Because I decided to say yes to God. We have school. Now we, we are also we ha we are working on, on an orphanage. Because we want to just help. We are just in, in our school. Where we have 200 children. We are just helping. At giving them education, books and uniforms. We cannot give them shelter food and medical but next step is to provide food and uh, medical and shelter to children because in, in March this year I was invited in a village and uh, the topic of that revival meeting was pure religion so when I was studying and working on my message I talked to my wife, how I can preach on this mess, on this verse if I am not doing this? Pure religion is to take care of orphans and visit the widows and all these things. I said, how I can do that? How I can preach that? So at that time I prayed to God, God, I want to do something for orphans. We want to start with 50 children. And I can see now, think God is putting things together. And we will do it by his grace. Planting churches, building churches, and uh, helping children. We are on TV. You have seen already through CMI. We are airing messages, and uh, we are reaching to many men. Uh, we, we are reaching to millions of uh, Urdu-speaking people, and we are sharing the gospel with them. And God is helping us to do. When we say yes to Him, He does amazing things. We just. I'm trying to make it short because of time. So next, how we do plant churches in Pakistan? As you already know, it's not easy. Pakistan is a very difficult place. How do we do then? One, one word, courage. We need courage to do great things. Coward people cannot do great things. Only courageous people can make difference in this world. I preached a message in South Korea, one act of courage. One act of courage can change the story of your lives. 
So that's what we are doing in Pakistan. We don't force people. We don't convince people to, to become Christians. No. We are just making Jesus attractive for them. We are making Jesus attractive for them. So they, they know that we are helping. Uh, recently, we had terrible flood in the history of Pakistan. 60% Pakistan was flooded. 33 million people are displaced right now. And we decided, okay, we want to reach people with the, we had nothing. But just I posted on Facebook, we are going to help 500 families. God just started putting things together. And last, last, uh, last week, we were able to reach 500 families. In one trip, we went to, sp uh, to provide supplies to 100 families, then 200 families. And then last week in Sindh area, we provided relief to 200 families and mosquito nets also because people were going through. And the, many children, they, they got malaria because of uh, uh, mosquitoes. So we, we, don't, we don't force people to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We have to make Jesus attractive. Somebody said, maybe the owner of Coke, his vision was that everybody must taste Coke before he or she dies. My vision is everybody must hear the name of Jesus Christ before he or she dies. We want to take gospel to in different difficult areas. We want to reach to people. And when last week our team was in Sindh province where, where many families are uh, uh, displaced and they're going through difficult time, God opened more doors for gospel. There are so many tribal Hindus and other people. So my team told me that's the best place to share the gospel. I said, we will do that. We will do that. Because it's easy. Felt need matters a lot. So when we, when we make Jesus attractive, we love them. We, we reach uh, to them and provide them what they need in their difficult time. That makes great difference. So people are so happy. They are singing. Uh, we will I will show you one more video. They are tribal people. They are singing worship. They are worshiping the Lord in their own language just because we are hugging them, we are providing them, we are loving them. That's how we make Jesus attractive in Pakistan. We will make heaven full until Jesus comes. So that's our vision in Pakistan. 97% Muslims. How we do plant churches? Just courage. One act of courage. We are courageous to do that. We are, I'm sold out for the gospel. I, I am ready to pay any price to reach people to share the gospel with them because God has trusted me. I had nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm very from, I'm from very poor and humble background. My father was a poor farmer. Nobody finished high school in my family. Why did God train me? Why did God help me to finish my PhD even? Because God trusted me. He wanted me to do his work in Pakistan. So I'm sold out. I'm born slave. I want to serve the Lord. It doesn't matter what it costs to do that. I will do that. So that's my vision. That's my plan. And trust me, the growth in my church, in my mission, is beyond comprehension. Sometimes I'm surprised how things are happening. Churches are being planted. We are helping and feeding people. We are educating children. We are reaching to flood affected families. So many things. We started school to train leaders to send them in different areas of Pakistan. I started in my city in 2015. Then we started, last year we started in Sialkot city. And this year we started in southern Punjab. 53 students we got in our first class. 53 students. And right now in three hour campuses, we have over 100 uh, students in our, in, in our Bible school. We are not raising scholars. We are not ra raising uh, scholarly people. We are just raising missionaries and ministers, those who are ready to carry out the great commission of Jesus Christ. That's, I, that's my vision. I studied PhD. I, I don't know. I have used big material, big notes, or heavy material in the church. People need simple gospel. 
I want to share with them. We want to reach to them. So 100 churches is not big. I believe that it seems it's big, but it's not. God is going to do that. So I have, wherever I go, I try to share with people, with my brothers and sisters in here, here in America. If you're walking with God and you don't have a story to tell people, then re-examine your walk with God. I always try to re-examine my walk with God. So I can say it's beyond comprehension how mission and ministry is growing in Pakistan. And I want to say thank you for your prayers and for your support, Gospel Light Baptist Church. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim, for allowing me to come and share what God is doing in Pakistan. So we will not stop doing what we are doing in Pakistan. We want to share the gospel, true gospel with people by helping them and by loving them. We want to make Jesus attractive in Pakistan. So I can share more things. Even a person from poor country, how he could publish a book and it's available on Amazon. I, I never thought it. It's just God. Trust me, I, I, I cannot imagine what God is doing. I cannot thank enough but God is doing for me, through me in Pakistan. I'm just standing in the gap, and he's the one who is doing everything there. Just I decided to say yes to him. I said yes to him. And then, how do we plant? I said, courage. I need courage. And God gave me one. So That's how we are reaching in Pakistan to many, many people. Many people, when they watch my messages on TV, they contact with me. Oh, thank you so much. You're a very different teacher. I said, I'm not. It's God. God is helping me to preach. And God is helping our friends to air messages through CMI in Pakistan. God is amazing God. Some people, they have so many complaints against God. But God is not. God is so good God. If you know God better, you would love him more and more. He's so loving God. I have experienced his love. I want many people to experience his love too. So it's time to share the, share the word of God. I was in a church two weeks ago, and I shared about my mission in Pakistan. Then I shared message, and pastor told me, he told his people, actually. He said, I don't want to support a missionary who doesn't preach the gospel. I want to support a missionary who preaches the gospel, not only doing things, different things in mission field, but he should preach the gospel. I said, I'm the one. I'm the one I want to share the gospel with people. We don't do things. We don't help people. We don't feed people just for, as a uh, social welfare work or hum humanitarian work. No, we don't do that. Everything what we do in Pakistan is for Jesus Christ. To make him known in Pakistan. These, these small things are just a channel to reach people. Ultimate target is to share the gospel with them. That's Purpose of my life. That's the mission of my life. So let's turn our Bibles. The book of Luke, chapter 23. I will start from verse 35 through 43. The book of Luke, chapter 23, 35 through 43. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying... He saved others. Let saved others. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man hath done nothing amiss and he said unto Jesus Lord remember me when thou comes into thy kingdom 
And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. So, this morning, I want to share about three crosses. And the title of my message is The Love of Christ's Redeeming Heart. The Love of Christ's Redeeming Heart. We are going to focus on the three crosses that we see in the passage. These three figures on Calvary. Because each of them shows something to us. Something important. How we respond to Jesus and how and, uh, uh, and about what Jesus offers to us. Hanged upon the first cross is an unrepentant thief. The first cross shows the tragedy of a resistant heart. The tragedy of a resistant heart. Hanged on the second cross is a thief who turns from his sin who seeks for mercy, the second cross reminds us the necessity of a repentant heart. First cross, the tragedy of a resistant heart. Second cross shows us the necessity of a repentant heart. And of course, hanged upon the third cross with these two criminals on either side, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The third cross shows the love of Christ's redeeming heart. The tragedy of a resistant heart, the necessity of a repentant heart, and the love of Christ's redeeming heart. So number one, the tragedy of a resistant heart. Verse 35, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, and the Roman soldiers likewise, who comprise Jesus' death squad. They join in, don't they? Verse 20, uh, 33 says, 36 says, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. In each case, these taunts are designed to wound and to mock Jesus, to expose him to public ridicule. The Jewish mockery highlighted his claim to be the Christ, the Messiah. The Roman soldiers, on the other hand, highlight his claim to be a king. But all of them say, if he is who he claimed to be, one thing that would really prove it, prove it to us is his coming down from the cross. The tragedy of a resistant heart. You remember how the devil spoke to Jesus at the beginning of his ministry in too many, in too terribly uh, dissimilar terms. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from the pinnacles of temple. You don't see the similarity between the language of devil and this unrepentant or resistant heart thief. They're using same, very similar terminology. Devil was saying, if you are the son of God, Jesus has, has no doubt about it that he is the son of God. I have no doubt about it that Jesus is son of God. Yes, many people, they do have doubt that Jesus is not a son of God. They say that Jesus is a prophet. That's the problem we have in Pakistan. That's the problem we face in Pakistan. That's the reason we are discriminated, rejected, and killed in Pakistan because our friends, Muslim friends, they say, don't call Jesus the son of God. He is a good man. He was a good prophet. That's all. But I cannot compromise on, the, compromise on that. Jesus is son of God. He was son of God. And there was no time when he was not son of God. He is eternal son of God. He coexisted with God. He was God. He is God. He will be God. Amen. If you read the book of Psalms, Psalm 2 says that. 
Jesus, this is the identity of Jesus Christ. The identity of Jesus Christ is this, that he is son of God. God said, he is my son. He is my son. Psalm 2. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said, said unto me. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Thou art my son. You are my son. Jesus is son of God. When did Jesus become the son of God? 2000 years ago when he was born in Bethlehem? No. Was, did Jesus became, become the son of God when psalmist was write, writing these words about Jesus Christ? No. This day, what, what is this day? Today? Today or 2000 years ago or when psalmist was writing prophecy about Jesus at that day? No. This day is eternal this day. And that's why John writes in his, in his gospel beautifully. And I love these words when I read. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. If you read this verse like this. In the beginning was the, mis the Christ and the, the Jesus Christ was with God and the Jesus Christ was God. Who is word? Jesus Christ. So there was no time when he was not son of God. He has been always son of God. He's eternal son of God. He didn't become the son of God when he was born from the Virgin Mary. No, he was already son of God. Amen. Somebody said, when man landed on the moon, President of, President of America said, this is the greatest day in the history of mankind. And somebody said, no, President, it's not the greatest day. The greatest day was when, when God landed on the earth. That was the greatest day in the history of mankind. Man, God became man. Not man became God. God became man. He is son of God. Satan's temptation here now attack our savior again on the jeering lips of his murderer, inciting him to turn from the path of suffering that ironically defines the necessary work that the Messiah came to accomplish, the crucifixion itself. I guess this is the last temptation. This is the last try of devil to stop Jesus what he came to do. Devil. The devil wanted to kill Jesus Christ and he didn't want him to go to cross and die on our behalf. The devil never wanted that. So now he's using this unrepentant thief. But he did in wilderness. He was asking Jesus, if you are son of God, command these stones to become, uh, command, command these stone to become bread. No, he is using this thief. They're using the same words. And this first thief himself dying under the judicial sentence passed over him does not think of his own soul in this moment. So this first thief has no remorse, no acknowledgement of personal guilt. There's no seeking of mercy from God. He joins the rulers and the soldiers. The same satanic slander and opposition to Christ that fills their mouth fills his also. This man is the personification of hard-hearted resistance to saving grace. This man is a personification of hard-hearted resistance to saving grace. After all, the man, the one person who could deliver him was hanging beside him. And the appointed means that God had ordained by which his salvation could be secured was the cross of Jesus Christ. And he now so thoroughly despises it. He despises it. The form of his opening question, are you not the Christ? Is itself a well-aimed barb. It's, it's another way of saying, what kind of Christ are you? What kind of Christ are you? Call yourself a savior. If you really were, you would get me out of this mess. 
save yourself and us, that's the best you know that an unrepentant heart can muster when it comes to Jesus Christ. If it think of Jesus at, uh, at all, it is, a, it is as a good luck charm. Get out of jail free card. Maybe Jesus will get out of me the out of out of me hook of the of the hook. That's all this man thinks of here. If you were really who you say you are, Jesus wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be sick, I wouldn't suffer, I wouldn't struggle financially. If you were really, if you really loved me, Jesus, you would fix this for me. Here is the thing somebody said. There are two kinds of responses to our own personal suffering. First, we can rail against God and say, if you are such a great and powerful and loving God, why I am in this, in this hellish mess? Why I, why I am in this hellish mess? Or secondly, we can acknowledge that we are sinners and don't deserve any good thing and cry out for our mercy, for mercy and help in our time of desperation. The world, somebody said, is full of those who rail against God in their self-righteousness and presume that the creator of the universe is obliged to make their lives smooth. But there are only a few who owns up to the faith who owns up to that fact that God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing. Bible says that who has given me first, so, sh so I, sh I should give him back. Who has given me first? If we have good things, if we are blessed, if we have good health, if we have good bank account, if we have good uh, situation or any good thing if we have, it doesn't mean that we deserve it. It means that he is good God and he has given us. When we get good things, it doesn't mean that we are good. It means that he is good God. He is good. We don't deserve good. It's his love that he gives us good things. He's good God. He's loving God. He owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. We have never given him anything first, so he should give us back. Everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. So if we have, it's his love and mercy. He's good God. That's what we need to tell people. He is good. So many people in this world, they are like this uh, unrepentant thief. They are, they are complaining against God. They're always saying, what God has done for me. God is not answering my prayers. God is not so loving God. I have not experienced his love. If he's good God, why I am in this bad situation? Why I am going through difficult time? Why I am sick? Many people, when they are sick and they are not, they are not healed, they start complaining against God. Oh, if God is loving God, why I am sick? I'm so... I'm, here's the deal. When I started ministry, I started serving the Lord. I was sharing somewhere. I didn't start serving the Lord to get blessed. Just I wanted to serve him. But he blessed me later. That's perspective I support, I love. When Jesus is in your picture, your life will definitely get better. If we are asking God, I will do for you, you will do for you do for me. It's transactional relationship. It's like a, you scratch my back, I will scratch your back. God is not, God doesn't work like that way. Unconditional obedience, unconditional worship. Why? Because he deserves our worship. He's worthy of all praises. Unconditional obedience he wants from us. So some people, they, are, they want to be obedient to God, but they have some conditions too. Unconditional obedience God wants from us. Let me move to second thief. The necessity of a repentant heart. heart. Think, of, think about the similarities 
between the two men just for a moment. They, are, they have a similar background, don't they? Second thief makes two speeches. First, he rebukes the other criminal who was, who, who has continued his bombardment of mockery. And the second speech is directed to Jesus himself. Notice that he says to the first thief in the first place, do you not fear God since you are under the same sense of condemnation? And we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man had, has done nothing wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. That's true. Jesus was not on the cross because he did something wrong. He was on the cross because he loved us. He died for our sins. Secondly, this man knows that his sin condemns him justly. We are receiving the due reward for our deeds. He says, God is just and we are sinners. There's no self-justifying words here. There's no attempt to make excuses. He is owning his guilt in the sight of God. And more even than that, his words reveal remarkable faith in Christ, this man. I made one observation on this passage. Last, this year, good, on Good Friday, I preached on, mess, on this message in my language. If you, if you listen to me in my language, I'm on fire. <laughs> so, so I was preaching. I, I was sitting just like I was sitting here and they invited me to preach and I was praying, God used me, use me for your glory. I want to just tell people what you have done for us. So when I, when I was sitting there on the chair and uh, God put in my heart, very important thing. I, I didn't study anywhere. I didn't read it in, in any book. Just God put in my heart that thing. He gave me this idea. This man on the second cross is rebuking his friend. He's admitting that he is a sinner. He admits that he is here because he deserved to be here. But Jesus has done nothing wrong. Here is the deal. I made that observation. Why? What is the difference between two these, these thieves? So first thief is insulting, mocking, railing. And saying, Jesus, what kind of Christ you are? Save yourself and us. Why you are here on the cross? There are many people, those who are like first thief. They are not willing to admit that they have done wrong. There are many people. They are always blaming God for their situation. They don't want to admit that I am here because I did wrong. I'm here because I was not listening, God. I was not, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm here because I was not doing right. So when first thief was insulting Jesus Christ, he was, uh, he, was, uh, again, uh, he was mocking Jesus. Jesus didn't say anything. But second thief, when he spoke, he made two speeches, one to Jesus, one to his friend. He told his friend, we are we are here because we deserve to be here. But this man has done, not, done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Here's the problem. Many people, they are praying for a long time, but they didn't get answer of their prayers. The reason? Because they are not acknowledging that they are sinners. Until we repent and confess and admit that we are sinners, we will never get answer of our prayers. The second thief was very wise and smart guy. He said, I am sinner, Jesus. I did wrong. That's why I am on this cross. Secondly, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come, when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, you, today you will be with me in paradise. First thief Talked a lot. Jesus didn't answer. Heaven will never answer until we admit our sins. And second thief, 
He, admi he admitted and immediately, I think he was really smart guy. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus told him, it didn't take a long time to get answer of his prayer. Jesus immediately, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's why Proverbs 28, 13 says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whose, uh, whoso confessed and forsake them shall have mercy. Mercy follows after we admit our sins. So this guy, uh, he admitted and immediately he received the answer of his prayer. So if someone, uh, someone of us this morning is feeling that I, my prayer has been not answered, I have been praying for a long time, maybe this is the reason. We should come before him and admit that Jesus, yes, something is wrong with me, not with you. Remember me. Jesus, Jesus will definitely answer our prayers. And second, and second observation I made on this passage, nobody would believe Jesus when he was on the cross that he is a king. His disciples didn't believe that he's a king when he was on the cross. If he's a king, why he's dying on the cross like other thieves? Why he's on cross? If, why, how, how sensible person could believe that he's a king because he was dying on the cross. But this second thief, he believed that he is a king even he's dying on the cross. He will have kingdom one day. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Where was kingdom? <laughs> Nobody could see kingdom of Jesus Christ. He did see the kingdom of Jesus Christ in future. And Jesus said, yes, I have kingdom, I'm king, and I'm coming back with my kingdom. I will have kingdom one day. Our Jesus will have ultimate kingdom in this world. Not like earthly king, kings or presidents, his kingdom will never last. His, his king, kingdom will never end. His kingdom will never end. So my dear brothers and sisters, this thief, he said, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise today. Today you will be, and he was with Jesus Christ in paradise. So, here is one more important thing. What we, what, 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 so what should we make of these first two thieves? Somebody said beautifully, brilliantly, he says this, True repentance is never too late, but late repentance is rarely true. True repentance is never too late, but late repentance is rarely true. True repentance is never too late. Isn't that the message here? If, if you're here, if you're watching at home, if you, if you are going online, it's, if you are thinking that, if you're telling yourself, it's too late for me, I'm too far gone, I have made too many mistakes, I have hurt too many people. What a mess I have made of my life. I have heard the gospel many times, but I have always found an excuse to come to Jesus. And now, as I think about it, as I look back, surely there's no way that Jesus should, should show, would show mercy, mercy, uh, me mercy. Listen, if that is you, learn from the second thief. It is never too late. Never too late. Never too late to turn from your sin to Christ. Even at the last posing for a moment that tonight or this morning, are you in your final days in this world? Even now, there's time. There's room for you to trust in Jesus Christ. Confess your sins on your own, on your guilt before God. Fear the Lord. Acknowledge the justice of his judgment upon your sin and cry with this man, Lord Jesus, remember me. Lord Jesus, righteous one, remember me. God's true King, Jesus, save me. Would you do that with me? There is always, there is a, always a welcome for you and me in Jesus, as we will see when you do. So my dear brothers and sisters, sometimes it's difficult 
to teach ourselves, control, uh, to, control, uh, to conquer ourselves. Somebody said, when we are a fool, we want to conquer the world. We want to save the world. But when we are wise, we want to conquer ourselves. Many people, they are trying to conquer the world. They are trying to save the world. Sometimes it is hard to hear the voice inside that I'm not being conquered by you. <laughs> it's the most difficult thing to conquer ourselves, to teach ourselves, to speak to ourselves. So we can, maybe sometimes we don't feel that I need um, to ask mercy or forgiveness from God. Even we are saved sometimes, we need it to make right relationship with Jesus Christ. So third, the love of Christ's redeeming heart. This is the best example in New Testament of the grace of Jesus Christ. The second thief didn't do right thing. After he dies, he will not do any right thing. How he got saved, how he made it into heaven just because the grace of Jesus Christ. Just because of the, it doesn't take long to get saved. You're, you don't need, you don't need read to whole Bible to get saved. You don't need to memorize certain verses to get saved. It takes only Jesus, I confess, I admit my sins, I believe that you are my Lord and Savior. Forgive me. That's how we become the member of his family. It doesn't take long to get saved. It doesn't take years to get saved. It's immediate. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the best example of, that's why wherever I go, I try to tell, share with people, we are not going to get into, into heaven, what we are doing, we are going to get into heaven, what Jesus has done for us. Because of his grace, because of his finished work on the cross. Pastor, are we okay with time? Can I take two, three minutes more? Okay, with your permission. I'm under your leadership. <laughs> I watched a clip, video clip. It was beautiful. The guy was saying, if you go to heaven and you are asked by angels how you made it here, if you try to answer in first person, you cannot stay there. We have to answer in third person. Just he was saying, okay, let's take this second thief. He went to heaven. Angels stopped him. Hey, guy, how did you come here? He said, I don't know. What church you were used to go? He said, I don't know. Okay, what Bible study you were part of? He said, I don't know. Okay, just give me a few. I will, go I will come back. Let me talk to somebody. He went back and came back. Angels asked him again, how did you come here? Who allowed you to come here? He said, when we were on the cross... A man on the middle cross said to me, you can come. And I have come here. The man on the middle cross said to me, you can come. If Jesus says you can come, you will come. We will go. He has said, you can come through me to Jesus, to Father. I need you. I said, Jesus is not a way. He is the way to go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven without Jesus. There is no shortcut. We have to go through Jesus Christ. There's only one way, and that way is Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord of my life and your lives. So Jesus saves. Praise God, his cross atones. No one is beyond the pale. There are no lost causes. It is never too late. So come, won't you come? like the dying thief, empty-handed and guilty to Christ, crucified. Come right now, right now as we invite you, as he invites you to himself, ask him for mercy. You don't need grand words. You don't need grand words. My father was a poor farmer. He was never in church much. He was always on the farm to, to raise six children. When he came back home, he was very old, and he didn't know how to pray. He didn't know how to pray, but he had very strong faith in Jesus Christ. Then early morning, 4 o'clock, he was used to pray in broken words. Sometime he, for, he was used to forget what he's praying, but he was used to pray for me, for pastors, for the world, for preachers. 
and it was powerful. We don't need grand words. You just need to pour out your heart, confess your sin, ask him for rescue. At the cross, I want to a little bit stress on this, at the cross, all the mercy you need has been secured. All the mercy you need has been secured. He is your willing rescue, rescuer. We need to come to him. Without him, our lives will never be blessed. It's not like we want, we want to serve him, to, we want to come to church him to get blessed, to get healed. No, we come to church because he deserves our worship. He deserves all the praises. That's how I understand Jesus Christ. He's so loving. He's so good. I made this choice that he is my Lord and Savior. He came in my picture and my life started getting better. Thank you so much. God bless you.